Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're going to answer some of the questions we get about uh, gardening resources, I would call it. I get a lot of questions about where did I get this? Where did I get that? Where did you find this plant? Where did you find, uh, where did you find that material? Uh, and so we wanted to answer, put, put those things in one video about how we go about uh, finding things. I've been in this business for 38 years, various roles as a garden center, you know, so I was buying all kinds of materials to resell for that and then in the landscape business uh, and having to find plants and materials for landscape jobs and then uh, as a nurseryman as well. You have to buy, you're always, we're always trying to uh, source materials uh, in the best way possible and the least, least expensive way possible. Uh, we are in the process of mulching the garden uh, with a triple shredded hardwood mulch. Uh, this used to just be called double shredded hardwood mulch and then something I guess happened to the shredder at some point and they started calling it triple shredded hardwood mulch. I've never understood this. It may still be called triple, uh, double shredded hardwood uh, where you are. It's a material that I really like to use is in, in our beds. It's not a dyed material, you know, like a brown mulch or a black mulch or a red mulch. It's just the regular bark from a hardwood tree where the lumber industry is probably using this, you know, cut, cutting this up into boards and this is the waste material from it. But it makes fantastic mulch because it, it is all various sizes and the fibers are all different and so it tends to mat on itself really well and hold really well in place. I got this pile from um, a landscape supply yard here in Raleigh. There are several of these landscape yards around the city of Raleigh, and in them, uh, they'll sell to they'll sell to anyone. Uh, I, it's a little bit less per yard for their landscape customers that are coming back, you know, literally daily sometimes or or weekly. Uh, it's going to be a little less money for them, uh, but they'll they'll not only sell it to you, they'll deliver it to your house. It's probably a good idea to. Uh, order, figure out how, what size truck they have. They're going to charge you the same freight kind of for 10 yards as they are for 15 or 16 or, you know, it's sold by the cubic yard. Uh, so you might want to get all you need at, at one time uh, that you're, that you're going to need because the freight's going to be the, you know, you're going to end up doubling the freight to do it over two loads. I like to get this dumped on a hard surface. It's much easier to work with off of a driveway. Uh, much, much harder to work, you know, out of a, if you dump it on a lawn or something like that, plus your lawn, uh, your lawn will suffer from that as well. The other things these landscape yards are going to have is uh, compost, uh, uh, topsoil. Um, I've never been a big fan of bringing in topsoil. I don't know where it came from. And they will typically run it through some sort of machine that will fluff it up and make it look really, really nice. And then after about a week, it's like hard as a rock back in your, back in your garden. Sometimes it'll be some sort of topsoil and compost blend. Maybe that's a little bit better. But again, I never know where that topsoil comes. So I, I tried to do that as little as possible on my landscape jobs. They'll have uh, rock materials, pine straw, all kinds of other materials that you can get for the garden. None of them are inexpensive. It costs a lot of money to source these things, to you know have them as a supply and then put them in a truck and uh, tote them around to people's houses. But there are some slightly less expensive uh, resources we'll talk about in this video. Compost wise, uh, our compost we get from Soil Cube and you guys if you've been following the channel for any length of time. It's a big one cubic foot bag that we get from Soil Cube. We have a couple of them coming for various projects this spring. So you'll see that uh, that's in North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia. You can get them, but if you can't, um, you know, if it's unavailable in your area, again, you can, the, a, a landscape yard near you uh, will likely have compost in bulk as well. Of course, there's tons of bagged products available at uh, all the um, garden centers, box stores. I'm not a giant fan of single use plastic if I can kind of avoid it. I, I try to avoid it as much as possible. And the price of bulk goods are so much less, in generally speaking, that soil cube bag can actually be returned and recycled uh, if you want to uh, keep it in good shape while you're using it. Uh, you can actually return that to them. But some things we end up, of course, buying in bags more and more a lot of the bagged material that's available for our gardens, for filling containers, uh, garden soils, uh, planting soils, you know, they might be called, have fertilizer in them. 
and I do not want fertilizer in my bagged product. Number one is, is it the right time to be fertilizing? I mean, the assumption would be if I'm buying this bag of planting mix in November and it has fertilizer in it, why? Uh, I don't want to fertilize necessarily something in November and try to get it to grow through the winter time. So more and more, it's just really hard to find materials that aren't made by someone who's just trying to force their fertilizer on you with, you know, without a better way to say that. Uh, and so I don't want the fertilizer blended in. I want to use organic fertilizers. Uh, but again, we do buy a few things in bags. Some, we like to use pine bark soil conditioner where we can. This clay, it, our clay soils really benefit from using, uh, from using uh, the bark off of a pine tree is what it is. You can get really small ground up pine bark and then really uh you know larger mini nuggets and nuggets but it works great in our clay soils of course pines aren't available all over the country so you can't necessarily find it uh, where you are but when i find really ground up pine finds whether it's in a bag or bulk we tend we tend to have some on hand i'll mix it into containers to get good drainage in my containers and i'll mix it in in my heavy clay based soil as well. So that's one thing I will buy in bags, but I try overall to avoid it where I can. One free resource, uh, this is, these are wood chips that we, uh, the chip drop website, you can put your name and address in and hopefully get someone who's doing tree work in your area to bring you uh, wood chips. There is a, a little thing on the website that allows you to add money for the driver and I would suggest you put 20 bucks or something on there because I think uh, this last time uh, I put our name down on the chip drop site uh, because I was tipping the driver $20 I got this load in 45 minutes. <laughs> so I think that that's probably part of the reason uh, they're looking at Basically, the guy they're doing tree work in your in or around your neighborhood, and they get the truck filled up with wood chips, and then they've got to drive them maybe an hour somewhere to dump them. They can look on this website and go, "Oh, there's somebody right around the corner that wants them," and then they'll bring them to you again. Best to drop them on a hard surface. They're really it's light and pretty easy material to work with, uh, as long as it's on a hard surface. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to uh, it's kind of hard to scrape up off the the bare dirt. Uh, they're pretty big loads of material, uh, and you need to be re when you put your name in there. You need to be ready for it. Have a spot on your driveway because it could be 45 minutes or it could be four weeks. Don't know how long that's going to take, but it's a great, almost free. I mean, it's free if you don't put a tip in, but I would suggest you do. But it's an almost free material that we start beds with. We do our garden paths with, as you can see here. Fantastic material to walk on. The dogs enjoy walking on it. It elevates our paths a bit above the beds. The water runs off. Great, great material and a super inexpensive resource. You can simply Google landscape supplies near me and your local landscape yards will come up. The other thing would be for things like drip irrigation, uh, which you can order a lot of those drip irrigation pieces maybe off of Amazon, but it's probably better to go to a a uh, place that sells those irrigation parts near you. And there's several places where landscapers go and buy drip irrigation tube and clocks and all those kinds of things. They'll sell to you uh, and there'll be somebody there that may help you out if you're trying to put some sort of drip irrigation system into your garden. Uh, I would go and uh, get, some, get, get some help uh, with, with that particular type of installation. One of the biggest gardening resources that's available is extension. So the, as an example here in North Carolina, we have 100, our state's divided into 100 counties and all 100 counties have an extension office uh, run by, through uh, North Carolina State University, which is right down the road here. So we have an extension agent in all 100 counties in the state, and this is pretty much true all across the country. Your extension office is a great resource for uh, you, they'll have websites like the North Carolina Extension website uh, has plant database, uh, all kinds of articles on various plants. They have they uh, run the Master Gardener program, so you can, if you want to become a Master Gardener or learn from other Master Gardeners, uh, they have garden speakers, garden events. Uh, it's a great place to network with other folks who 
who are gardeners in your area. They uh, will run the 4-H program uh, in all likelihood in your area. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to participate locally with other folks who are interested in gardening. And they, those other people are a great garden resource because if you're you know, asking me on a YouTube video, you're in Missouri and you're asking me on a YouTube video, how do you get mulch? There's likely someone at Extension in your area that would be the person that would be the best person to contact or people that are involved in Extension. Um, in the extension office in your area where they get bulk materials for their own gardens. One other thing you can get done through your extension agent in all likelihood is soil testing. So the state of North Carolina will do soil testing for our, uh, for our farmers and for our home gardeners. And you, the, you can go to the extension office in your county in all likelihood and get the box that's required for you to put your soil in and then you fill out on the front of the box and then you can drop it back off at your extension office or the lab happens to be here in Raleigh where we can drop it off uh, in, in person here in our area. There's other ways to go about getting soil tests though. Uh, you, you can order a kit from, you know, off of Amazon where they just send you the kit and then they give you the instructions and then you, they electronically later send you the, uh, the results of your soil test. There are all kinds of various private labs across the country that do great work on this. And if, you know, just, I, I do encourage people to get a soil test right out of the gate, but it's almost more for pH than anything else. Uh, you know, you could also get just a basic pH tester. That's at a bare minimum, something you need to know about your soil is your soil pH, whether it's where your soil's acid or alkaline. Uh, and that will determine probably the group of plants that are best to use uh, in your garden overall. pH determines nutrient uptake, and so various nutrients are more available when the pH is low, and others are available when the pH is high, and so there are plants that evolved in different soil types, and it's helpful to know that, at least that minimal piece of information, and so some sort of basic pH testing uh, is good, and that would come on that soil test that you could get done through extension. One other important factor uh, in your garden is the, your soil temperature. You think about the air temperature. We always think about how cold it is outside or how hot it is outside. The soil temperature tends to lag behind the air temperature a bit. It takes a minute for this soil to warm back up coming out of winter and going into spring. A lot of our summer annual plants, you know, your vegetable garden, your annual flowers and uh, other things do not like cold roots just as much as they don't like cold air temperature. And so like things like peppers and tomatoes really like the soil temperature to get up around 65 to 70. There's actually a website uh, that you can go to and I'll link this down below. It will show you your current soil temperature. So if we've had a cool spring all spring long and you get to your average last frost date, which for us is around April 15th, and you think it's time to put in your tomatoes or peppers or whatever it is, you should go to this website and make sure the soil temperature has also increased enough that it makes sense to be putting those things in the ground. That the, the roots, the, the, the temperature of the roots matter just as much as the temperature of the air. Backing up in the video slightly, the other thing I would say on bulk materials is your local municipality probably has some sort of mulch and compost program as well. So the city of Raleigh comes through and sucks up all these leaves every fall and, and early spring from people who rake their leaves out to the road and then compost them. And you can go and pick that up very inexpensively, very big bucket full of it. Uh, I've got a few neighbors that use that as their mulch and then they'll chip up Christmas trees and things like that and, and, and have mulch materials as well. So that's another inexpensive resource that you can use as well. I will say that one year I got mulch after Christmas and it was chipped up Christmas trees and they smelled wonderful, but they were full of people's plastic who are not taking everything off of their Christmas trees. So I did have that uh, one bad experience with it. But otherwise on my old landscape, uh, when I was a, uh, a young self-employed person and didn't have a lot of didn't have a lot of extra income that was my resource for mulch for my garden was the Raleigh uh, uh, municipality uh, mulch uh, mulching service uh, we order a lot of things uh, online uh, we go to a lot of local businesses here in Raleigh as well but we a lot of our seed comes from mail order uh, we order a lot from park 
seed. We order a lot from Baker Creek. Uh, Baker Creek uh, heirloom seeds, always fun, and they always send some a little extra thing uh, in the package that you would never thought to try in your garden. Uh, and uh, sometimes it, some, and that's a lot of, that's always a lot of fun, some sort of little surprise that they send out and, and really neat packaging uh, as well. Uh, we use a lot, you know, so there, there's a couple of online sources. I've used Johnny Seed um, as well, several others. And then we'll buy seed when we're in a, in a local, locally owned garden center here or on the road or at, you know, a box store, wherever. We're kind of um, equal opportunity seed purchasers and we like to collect seed here in the garden as well to save money on things that we reuse uh, every time. And we talk, that, talk about that a lot in the videos. Uh, there are a lot of online uh, plant sellers and you can find some interesting things that you may not find locally. Uh, we've shown off Plant Delights Nursery several times. We've unboxed some things from them. Their catalog is always uh, quite fun. And you've seen us unbox things from Mr. Maple. You've seen things from plantsbymail.com. Uh, there are other places that will open just on a few weekends a year, like Pine Knot Farms up on the Virginia-North Carolina border. It has an incredible hellebore farm. And during when the hellebores are in bloom, they have open house during that period of time. Mr. Maple has an open house. Plant Delights has an open house. There's a lot of these places. Not only can you order online and get interesting things that you may not be able to find locally uh, or in a size, a different size that you wanted or whatever, uh, they also have open houses where you can go and visit and see their gardens. A lot of them have gardens associated uh, with their uh, mail order catalogs as well. Sourcing plants uh, is interesting. Um, plants have gotten uh, very expensive, but we, again, we're equal opportunity plant purchasers. I love to go to our local garden centers that are in our area. They tend to have, you know, they have a knowledge base, number one, that you can't beat. I mean, a lot, most of the garden centers that are in our area in the Raleigh-Durham area are quite old. They've been around for a long time, some of them multiple generations, and these folks are an incredible asset. Uh, they have year guarantees on their plants, so they wanna make sure that you leave there with the information you need so that you don't return that plant uh, and that you have success in your garden. So definitely use these local businesses as a resource and understand those people are the most knowledgeable in your area. I mean, all these people can sit like me, can sit on YouTube and talk about this and that, but I don't have experience where you live and those people do. And sometimes again, multiple generations uh, in these garden centers. We're lucky enough in our area to not just have our local garden centers and, and whatever box stores that we have. We also have several of our nurseries open to the public, uh, sometimes on certain times and sometimes, you know, just all the time uh, I've got uh, we have se several. This is this one will be slightly harder to find. And again, I would I would encourage you to join some sort of garden group, uh, master gardener thing, uh, whatever. Th these are the people who are going to know where to go and buy the plants, where to get the best deals, where to get interesting things uh, in your area. It's going to take a minute, right? Because uh, here in Raleigh, I know the ones that are open, Adcox Nursery, which I've covered on the channel, are open on some Saturday mornings uh, to the public, certain times of the year. My friend Camillo, uh, C&J Nursery down in Benson, North Carolina, uh, he allows people to come to his nursery, and there's several others like that. that uh, we have some incredible growers here because North Carolina State University's horticulture program has produced a lot of these nurserymen. and. Uh, they, they're, they're not far from the mothership <laughs> in our area. And uh, some of them have chosen to open to the public and some not. So you need to call, you know, find those things out. But again, friends and other neighbors and other gardeners are gonna be the resource to tell you which ones are open and when they're open in your area. Backing up a bit on those uh, nurseries that are open, I said some would not be open and some would. There are just, a lot of the nurseries are just meant to be wholesale and they sell to garden centers and they don't want to compete with the garden centers they're selling to and so they don't open and where others do and it's just some do and some don't another great garden resource and we're really lucky here in the raleigh durham area to have great gardens and so duke gardens is over in durham we have the raleigh rose garden right here in our neighborhood we have 
uh, Juniper Level Botanic Garden, which is part of Plant Delights Nursery, which I already talked about mail order plants from uh, Plant Delights. But that garden, when it's open, is spectacular. There's almost nothing, there's almost nothing like it, uh, the amount of plants that are there. And then the Ralston Arboretum, which, you know, you guys, if you follow the channel for any length of time, you know we're over there uh, quite a bit. Uh, Mark Wethington, the director over there, is absolutely amazing. Uh, the his, you know, that garden has some, uh, some history, uh, J.C. Ralston, basically any plant professional that we go and visit in America, uh, J.C.'s name is going to come up in the conversation. He was a very influential person in horticulture and sharing plants and um, just, just, just an ama amazing history. So that garden, uh, just, just taking that garden as an example, they have a, a, if you go to their page, they have a what's in bloom section. So you can go and, and, and you can see what's in bloom at different times of the year. And here in Raleigh, we're lucky enough, we can have something blooming kind of all the time. You can go on there and find, uh, see, see a plant that you're interested in and find it in the garden. They have a, they have a locator on there. So it tells you where, you know, they have a map and, and where, where that particular plant is in the garden. If you wanna go and take a look at it, in the garden before you purchase it and add it to your garden. They have a lot of garden speakers, a lot of garden events uh, over there. They have uh, an event in April called Ralston Blooms. I spoke at it last year and I'm speaking there uh, this year as well in April. So really great resource. They have rare plant sales, uh, non-rare plant sales. They have a seed uh, for members at the Ralston. They have a, a seed uh, Thing every year where you can put in requests for seed from some of the plants that are out in the garden. So just a, a, a tremendous resource that you can get a ton out of. And that's just one of the gardens here uh, that, that they're doing. And I'm sure Duke has got, uh, you know, uh, Duke Gardens has, you know, programs and speakers and things, things like that. The other thing, you're uh, backing up to Extension again. Extension has speakers as well. Um, you know, over the course of the year, I've spoken at a few of the county Extension events uh, and there's a state, there's typically in your state, a state extension event too, where they'll really bring in some of the, uh, you know, big garden writers and, uh, some really, uh, some really very knowledgeable people in horticulture. Steph and I travel quite a bit for this channel, visiting nurseries and gardens and horticulturalists, uh, all over the place. And what we do when we get to areas is we Google gardens near me and find, uh, interesting gardens. And then we end up talking to someone in that area and they've never been to some of the places we've already been to in the day that we got there before we met with them. Uh, it's, it's always just kind of a funny thing. We'll, we'll sometimes know more about the area than the people who live there. Uh, there's a lot of things around you that you don't know exist. There's a bee garden in the neighborhood we showed off recently. Uh, just a neat little uh, garden. It's in our neighborhood that's a pollinator garden. Uh, going to uh, do a video later in the season when everything's awake over there uh, with the with the person who's in charge of that garden later this year. So um, follow along with the channel for that. I'm kind of excited for that. It's a garden we've enjoyed for three years and didn't know who uh, was the person that was in charge of it until I put it in a video and then they contacted me. So. The other thing, oh, one other thing is the USDA hardiness zone map. Uh, this is a map that average low temperatures over the last 30 years. Uh, it was just updated this year. Most everybody went into a slightly warmer zone because we've had a, tr a warming trend. Uh, and it, we're now in zone 8A where we were in 7B uh, on, the, on the old map. It's a good place to start, you know, with the plants that will grow in your area, but I still think your local gardens who have put the plants through, you know, uh, all of the extremes over the last 30 or 40 years or 50 years or ever how long the plants have been in the ground at the local gardens is probably a better indicator of what will grow and walking around your neighborhood um, and seeing what other people are growing is probably a, a pretty good idea because the, the US, the hardiness zone map doesn't take into account microclimates, wind, it's literally only a, this is the average low temperature that happened over this span. And it's not even what is the real lowest temperature that happened over that span. So if it, you know, if you, if you say my average low temperature over the last 30 years is 10 degrees, but we had a negative 10 degree night or negative five degree night during that span, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to have lost a lot of your plants, you know, based on an average. So it's a good place to start. 
but I think that examining the things that survive the extremes over time is a better way uh, to figure out what will grow in your area. The sunset climate zones for those folks out in the west is a fantastic resource for uh, heat uh, related issues. Uh, so where the USDA hardiness zone map is about cold, the sunset climate zone map is about heat. So we're pretty lucky. Our two dogs, uh, Holly and Griffin, Holly was in the video earlier, uh, they don't really come out here and chew on any of the plants. Uh, so we don't really have that issue of thinking about whether or not they're potentially toxic. Uh, if you do, and it's a concern of yours, the North Carolina Extension uh, plant database, which is run again out at North Carolina State University down the road here, has an incredible database of plants. There's other great databases too. The Missouri Botanic Garden database is unbelievable. Uh, the Rutgers deer resistant plant list is just out of this world if you have deer issues. Uh, but on the North Carolina uh, Extension list, if you look up a plant, let's say something like oleander, uh, it will say up in the upper left hand corner, it'll say this, all parts of this plant are severely toxic. So whatever the plant is, if it's toxic in some way, it'll be up at the top. The mildly toxic ones I don't worry about. Of course, if you eat enough of anything, it can be toxic. But you know, if they're severely toxic and your dog is chewing on things, you may want to avoid those plants potentially. Uh, and then one other, um, outside of those websites, which again, the Missouri Botanic Garden website's unbelievable. Um, you know, for, for, for finding plants. One other way that you can initially identify something uh, and then, and then def, uh, find out more information on these other websites later is using uh, one of these apps for your phone to identif initially identify the plant. So I did a video on this, just trying to figure out which one was overall the best of these plant identification apps. And I think PlantNet is probably overall the most consistent one for us. And uh, on, on this app, it just says, you know, touch to identify right in the middle of the screen. I can hit, I can hit that and up pops my camera because I've given it permission. And I can take a photo of this Laura Petalum. And if it's okay photo, I just hit okay and then it allows me to identify it by its leaf or its flower or its fruit or its bark or its habit. And if I hit flower, uh, it uh, goes through and identifies it as Laura Petalum chinense or Chinese fringe flower, which is completely accurate. I can confirm that that's accurate to help the app later. Uh, this, um, the one thing about it though, it's not telling me that this is purple daydream Laura Petalum. There's a lot of Laura Petalum named cultivars that are available. We have four in this garden alone. Uh, so it's not going to tell me that this is purple daydream Laura Petalum, which stays small versus Carolina midnight Laura Petalum, which I have over there that uh, was in a background earlier that's 15 feet tall and can get 25 feet tall probably, but it is a starting point. I now know it's Laura Petalum and then I can go over to my local garden center and maybe they can tell me more about, you know, the sizes and the shapes and the foliage color and the flower color on these and or the Missouri website or the North Carolina Extension uh, database uh, will have varieties as well. Uh, you know, so again, it's a great starting point if you're moving to a new area, you're trying to learn the plants or you're just walking around your neighborhood with your dogs and go, wow, I'd really love that plant. I wonder what it is. PlantNet works pretty quick and easy to identify uh, those plants. Uh, and the basics of identifying those plants. So what garden resources do you use in your area? We'd love to know, uh, tell everybody down below and it will help people uh, who are looking at this video, maybe uh, something in your area that's unique uh, where you get supplies or uh, where you um, learn information on the uh, internet. Thanks for watching.